Um, it'll be moderated by Dr. Sire, uh, Sarah Myrie, founder of the Rowan Institute and founding board member of 500 Women Scientists. And she will lead us in a conversation with female professionals across STEM disciplines about the barriers they have overcoming, that they have overcome during their careers, what they have seen change, and what the future of women in STEM could and should look like. So I hope to see some of you again next week for that discussion. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you all to our speaker, Deborah Green. Um, for Always Book a Window Seat, Reflections of a Female Geologist. So Deborah is this year's John's Distinguished Lecturer in Applied Geology. She holds degrees, uh, geology degrees from the University of Rochester in the Center for Engineering Geology at Texas A&M. She's a licensed professional geologist with over 30 years of experience working on environmental and engineering projects across the United States. And for more than 20 years, she's been a self-employed consultant. Now, since I've retired, she's writing novels about who a, a protagonist who is an engineering <coughs> geologist working on the dam with a problemat problematic foundation. All right, so at this time, join me in welcoming Deb. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I really appreciate you being here. And thank you, Brett, for that nice introduction. And thank you for having, to the Pacific Science Center for having me as uh, part of the Science in the City program. I really appreciate it. And um, I also want to thank the two professional associations that selected me as the Richard H. Johns Lecturer. So Dick Johns was a leader in engineering geology. He's best known for his leadership in academia. He led departments at Caltech, Penn State, and Stanford. And uh, back in the 1970s, he actually started a department of applied earth sciences when it wasn't so fashionable for engineers and geologists to work together. Um, they, they tended to learn that on the job, but were, were very separate in academics. And so he was very forward thinking for his time. And he was very well loved. And after his death in 1983, several professionals got together and they started this lectureship that's named in his honor. And so I'm the 31st John's lecturer and the second woman to serve in the role, and the first woman to do so in 20 years. And the goal of the lectureship is to promote student awareness of applied environmental and engineering geology. And so I'm hoping this is gonna be the beginning of more and more diverse voices um, traveling around the country and speaking with students about, about applied geology, the importance of the profession and roles that they can take in it. So what is applied geology? Well, I think a lot of people know that the term economic geology is geology applied to mining. Petroleum geology is geology applied to oil and gas exploration. In the context of my career and all my presentations, applied geology is geology applied to environmental and engineering projects. So, when people hear that I'm a geologist, if they say, do you look for oil? I say, only the kind other people have spilled. <laughs> so examples of, en of environmental projects are investigation of contaminated sites, like uncontrolled hazardous waste sites, or uh, a, a, a site in the area of Gasworks Park was, was a contaminated site that's been remediated and has been turned into a park. <laughs> Uh, old dry cleaners where the chemicals have been spilled, gas stations where the tanks have leaked. So those are all the kinds of sites that geologists would investigate to understand what kind of contaminants are in the ground and the groundwater and, and where have they gone. And then we work in multidisciplinary teams to remediate them. So the teams can include geologists, environmental engineers, microbiologists, toxicologists, chemists, geochemists, so, so it's a very interactive type profession. We often work in multidisciplinary teams. Other types of environmental work can be uh, doing site investigations and detailed, detailed site characterizations of proposed waste sites, like new landfills or new waste processing facilities. We can even just audit or inspect waste sites. Let's say if we're working as a consultant before a client takes a waste to a site, we may audit that site to make sure that, that the company is doing their environmental due diligence and that they're not gonna end up with a contaminated site. 
and you can't tell from all the protective clothing, but that's me. Um, and I'm filtering groundwater samples at a super fun site in New Jersey that I was working at. And this is not a contaminated site, and we were collecting um, shallow soil samples there. So types of engineering geology projects that, that we work on. Uh, slope studies of all types and evaluating risks for landslides, debris flows, rock falls, things like that. Paleo seismology studies, I know that there have been some done in the Seattle area. What that does is it's studying a fault to see how active it is, to see when the last earthquake was on it, to see how big those events were. Generally speaking, earthquakes don't kill people, stuff falling on them kills people. So the US Geological Survey has a program called the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program that has, has made a big push to study faults in urban areas, and that information gets given to city planners and building code um, engineers. So that's, that would be an example of a paleo seismology project. This is actually a trench across the Sandia Fault north of Albuquerque. And uh, it's actually an old picture. We're still hand logging the trenches there. And now what we do is, it's one of the changes in technology, we do a photo mosaic of the trench wall, and then we do the log um, in a computer graphics program over the photo mosaic. And some of us old timers really miss hand drawing logs. <laughs> Um, and, and this is um, a woman who has her own company called Appalachian Landslide Consultants, and she's studying uh, a, an unstable slope. And that is the beginning of what's going to be called, it's what's, what could be a headscarp of a landslide, basically the top of a landslide, and they're evaluating that. Other types of engineering work include developing water resources, geotechnical investigations of foundations of all sorts from single family homes to skyscrapers to large infrastructure projects like dams and bridges, like the Highway 99 tunnel, um, and um, also doing things like infrastructure retrofits and remediations and even dam removals, like, like the dam removals, the two dams that were removed on the Elwha River, um, and that dam removal project was finished in 2014. And a lot of dams were built in the 50s and 60s and are reaching their design life. And there's been a lot of conversation in, in several professions, geology and ecology and engineering, about whether these dams should be retrofit and remediated or whether they should be removed and let the ecology um, recover. And so it's, there's, there's a lot of interesting things happening in the fields these days. So those are just a few examples, but you can get a sense of why understanding geology is important and why the profession of environmental and engineering geology matters. And so one of the things I've been telling students, I almost think of it as the tagline for my lectureship is that it's a profession where you can make a living and make a difference. So today we're gonna to talk about um, how geologists see the world and, and why that perspective is important. So, so window or aisle? We get asked that question whenever we get on a plane. You can see from this sunrise over the mountains east of Phoenix that I always pick a window seat. It's true that it takes a little longer to get to the restroom and to stretch your legs and maybe you have to build a little extra time to get to your connecting flight. But I just can't bear to think of the views of the landscape that I'd miss if I were sitting in an aisle seat. I even think about which side of the plane to sit on, depending upon where I'm flying. So uh, this is a picture of the Grand Canyon while I was flying from San Diego to Albuquerque or seeing the Cascades. When I'm flying into Seattle from the south, I always sit in, in a right-hand side seat so I can see the, the Cascades on the way up. This is actually flying in from San Francisco. This is the Three Sisters, and there's Mount Hood east of Portland. And just before the clouds close over, um, as we're headed down into SeaTac, that's Mount St. Helens, and on the north side, you can see, just, you can just barely see through the clouds where the 1980 eruption blew the north side of the mountain out. So speaking of planes, I spent a lot of time on them in my professional life and for this lectureship um, in the last few months as well. And it's pretty common to fall into conversation with the people you're sitting with. Um, and I cannot count the number of times that when I've told someone I'm a geologist, they say something like, 
oh, I took one class, and if I'd been a freshman instead of a junior or senior, I would have changed my major. And you know what, they should have anyway, because this is the best profession that I can think of. It's just so much fun, and, um, and it's so interesting. And I know uh, so many of my colleagues think the same way. But even if you're not a geological professional, you can view the landscape with a geologist's eye. And why would you want to do that? Um, well, we see aspects and applications of geology every day, and not just in the display cases of, of, a, of a campus geology department. If you brushed your teeth this morning and clean water came out of the tap, a geologist had something to do with it. Um, and also, the toothpaste probably had calcium carbonate, fluorite, rutile, silica, or zeolites, or some combination of those minerals. A geologist had something to do with that. If you threw some trash away, a geologist had something to do where that tr with where that trash will end up, by siting the landfill in the right place, or working with engineers on a design that's best suited for the site's geological setting. Or, I don't know, let's see if we can see this. See that right there? Those are bollards to keep uh, trucks from knocking down a monitoring well. And so a geologist has something to do with sampling those monitoring wells to make sure that the landfill's not contaminating the environment. Okay, has anybody seen something like this? Raise your hands if you've seen something like this on a sidewalk or parking lot. Does anybody know what it is? It's, it's what's called a flush-mounted well casing. So underneath that, that cover is a groundwater monitoring well. And that means that, some, that a geologist is studying the physical and chemical parameters of the groundwater in that area. If you drove here or took a bus, a geologist had something to do with the fuel that, that ran that vehicle. And another geologist had something to do with making sure that the oil refinery where that fuel was processed isn't contaminating the environment. And those are just a few examples of the ways geology, the study of the earth, and geologists, the people who study it, touch our lives every day. So there's lots of directions I could go at this point. We could talk about Earth's deep time. One of the ways I like to describe that is if you thought of all of Earth's history as one calendar year, starting on January 1st, um, then the dinosaurs were, were dominant in the middle of December of that one calendar year. They were extinct by the day after Christmas. The earliest human ancestors came onto the scene during the evening of New Year's Eve, and everybody alive on the planet today was born in the last millisecond of the year. So that's kind of a way to think about Earth's deep time. We could talk about the ceaseless motion of the Earth on a planet-wide scale of plate tectonics, or on a smaller scale of, of how movements, how Earth's movements, erosion and deposition shape the landscape on a day-to-day -day basis. We could talk about the punctuated equilibrium of, of evolution. We could go from the basic principles of geologic study to the latest technologies that are shaping the science today, but we don't have time for all that. So we're just gonna talk about a few examples of how geologists see and study the Earth. So I live in New Mexico, and this is a geologic map of the Albuquerque Basin. You can see the city of Albuquerque right here. Um, and, and this is a block diagram. The geologic map would correlate to that, that top surface of the block diagram. And what a geologic map does, it's a representation of rock units, the rock units at the surface of the Earth. And so in this, in this map, these, this pink unit is called the Sandia granite. It's a 1.4 billion year old granite that's a really prominent feature in Albuquerque. And this blue unit is what's called the Madeira limestone. It's a 300 million year old limestone. It was, it was deposited in, the, in, the, in an ancient sea, um, and it's a fossil bearing limestone. And there are a couple of interesting things to see in these figures. One of them is what's called the Great Unconformity. So an unconformity in general is a gap in the rock record that represents a period of erosion rather than intrusion or deposition. So basically materials being taken away rather than added. Um, and the term the Great Unconformity was first used by John Wesley Powell in 
19, in, pardon me, 1869, when he was exploring the Grand Canyon. And in the Western United States, the Great Unconformity is recognized as the contact between the Precambrian crystal basement rocks, the really old crystal basement rocks, and overlying younger rocks, which can be different units depending upon where you are. In this case, in Albuquerque, the Great Unconformity represents a very long period of erosion, more than a billion years. And um, where it's located, it's this line right here. It's that contact here. And uh, in the block diagram, Albuquerque sits here um, in the foothills of the Sandia Mountains, and the Great Unconformity is right there. And the other cool thing to see in this, in this feature is the Great Unconformity, you can see that contact is right here. It's about 6,000 feet in elevation over the city of Albuquerque. And the same contact is down here. And so underneath the Rio Grande, it's actually 25,000 feet below the surface. So these faults, there's been 30,000 feet of movement in 30 million years. Um, so that's, that's pretty amazing, at least to the geologist. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I live right about there, and that's the view of the mountains. I'm partial to sunrises, I have to say. That's the view of the mountains from my house. And for me, understanding how they formed actually enhances the beauty of the mountains for me. And uh, just because we're all getting to be experts in the great unconformity, it's the, the contact between that, those kind of craggy units and the layered units of the Madeira limestone. So how do geologists see and think differently? We're spatial thinkers. We can take what we observe in two dimensions and project the third dimension. If we're standing in front of a, of a highway road cut or a stream bank deposit, so we're seeing, we're seeing the height of it in, in two dimensions, we almost automatically project that third dimension in, into the road cut or into the stream bank. And if you think about it, in a sense, we almost think in four dimensions because we add time to that. We think about how the landscape is changing through time. On the flip side of that, we translate what we observe and what we map and what we drill into words and drawings for our work. And I'd say some, some geologists do this very naturally. Richard Johns, who, this lecture, who my lectureship is named for, um, apparently was just a really intuitive thinker in the field. And, and people who were in the field with him said he, just, he could see things and, and explain things that they never would have seen without him there. Others of us have to cultivate the skill, but I would venture to say it's something that all geologists do. So I'd like to do a little bit of an exercise now so that we can all practice a little bit of what geologists do. So what you're all going to do is hold your hands up like this, so that you have kind of a little vertical space in between your hands. And what we're gonna imagine is you're gonna imagine having to draw a cross section of the front of the room. And so take a few snapshots, maybe about four to six of them. Okay, is everybody taking their snapshots? Okay, who can describe the whole front of the room to me from that? Hard, right? <laughs> so that's what geologists do on a pretty regular basis. So I'm going to show you a picture of, we'll, we'll look at a couple of examples of cross sections. So this is a cross section a colleague of mine draw, drew. Uh, she owns a company called Appalachian Landslide Consultants and she was brought in to study a site where they'd altered the landscape. So the first thing that, that is on the picture is this is the surface of the landscape. We know that. Um, and so these are the boreholes that were drilled, the equivalent of those vertical snapshots that you just took. And from that, they filled in the various, the various units. And so here there's artificial fill, there's soil, there's something in this area called saprolite, which is a type of soil that's really interesting. It's weathered in place, and so it still has what's called the rock fabric. It almost looks like the rock, but it's much softer. And then there's weathered rock and then the crystalline hard rock at the bottom. And that's one of the reasons you can tell they ended the boreholes where they did. It's like, oh, okay, we're in the hard rock now. So they, they had their whole, their whole cross section that they needed to see. The other thing that's interesting about this cross section is 
so that this blue line is was a pre-construction land surface and they had altered the land surface and they were concerned that they were going to reactivate a landslide by removing this mass, this weight from the area. And there's two lines here that show projected failure planes if the landslide was reactivated. So in general, when we're doing those cross sections, it's kind of a three-step process. So the first step is that we draw the land surface. The second step is we, we drill the boreholes, like you guys just took your pictures of. And the third step, in the, in the most simplistic way of, of putting it, is we kind of connect the dots, okay? The problem is sometimes when you connect the dots, there's things in between you can't anticipate. So this is a picture that came from the Seattle Times in early 2014, right after Bertha hit her unexpected um, obstruction. And what happened was, you can see, so here's the land surface. These yellow and gray units are, are artificial fill, which there is a lot of at the surface and probably almost any big city. Um, and these are glacial deposits. And you can see there's lots of different kinds. They're described in this, in this key. But what's interesting is, so these are the boreholes. Again, your vertical snapshots and the obstruction they hit is in between them. And so anybody who's done any kind of work in the subsurface can tell you that these kind of things happen. Um, another thing that happens is that, um, if, especially if you're working in an older area, I was, doing, I was working on a project where we were actually remediating an old coal gasification plant in Massachusetts. We had what we were told were as builts of a sewer line, a hundred year old sewer line. Um, and the surveying was off. So we hit the hundred year old sewer line. Um, fortunately, we only hit the top of it instead of going through the whole thing. But um, anybody who's worked in the subsurface can tell you that these kind of things happen. And of course, in the case of Bertha's issue, it's resulted in huge lawsuits that I think are probably ongoing. Um, but I thought I'd, I'd bring a local example in. All right, and another thing geologists do is we don't just drill to get our information. We also look at the rocks. This is the Grand Canyon, and we're gonna start with the oldest rocks, and those are the inner gorge. It's called, the, they're called the Vishnu Schist and the Zoroaster Granite, and this is our old friend, the Great Unconformity. Um, and the, the Vishnu Schist and Zoroaster granite are 1.7 7 to 1.8 billion years old. And they're overlain by the Tapit sandstone, which is about 5.5 and a half, pardon me, I'll get this right, 525 million years old. And one of the things that's amazing about the Grand Canyon is we have a very long period of un uninterrupted deposition. So um, over 250 million years, and that's not very common. So it goes from the Tapit sandstone all the way up to the Kaibab limestone, which is 250 million years old. And so that's why one of the reasons that it's a wonderful place to study geology, because we have a very long rock record that's, that's undisturbed. And so one of the things that geologists do is we study the rocks and we study the structures, and then we can draw, again, cross sections that make that representation a little more easy to understand. So this is an example of the Vishnu Schist. This is the Zoroaster granite that intruded into it. There's the Great Unconformity and the Tapit sandstone all the way up to the Kaibab limestone. Um, what we also see in the Grand Canyon on a really grand scale is the erosion that much, much later in geologic history from about 40 to 70 million years ago to today carved and continues to sculpt the landforms that millions of people come to see in Grand Canyon National Park every year. And so that's that, that carving that's happening um, still today. So the Grand Canyon is a really great example because it's so well known and we can see such a long period of uninterrupted deposition um, of geologic time in its walls. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you can read shorter chapters in the geological story in road cuts and on trails all over the country and the world. So this is a road cut um, in Virginia, and it's 
I hope it's, you're able to see it. You see that fold? That's actually a folded sandstone bed and, and a bunch of geologists a bunch of geology students scrambling all over it because we get excited about stuff like that. Um, and colorful geologic, these are volcanic units um, in the Sisters Wilderness in Oregon. Um, I took that from a trail on, during a backpacking trip. And this actually I took from a road. Uh, this is a fault. You can see the fault right there. These are columnar basalts, which are faulted over volcanic ash deposits. And that's in a really beautiful state park that I had never heard of. Um, before. It's called Cove Palisades State Park in Oregon. Um, so not very far from here in a really beautiful place. So there's lots of ways that you can find these great ge geological things nearby um, and lots of great books to read. Uh, this book, John McPhee's Annals of the Former World. John McPhee is a very well-known writer who's written about a lot of things, but one of the things he, he wrote several books on was the landforms and the landscapes in the United States. And several of his books have been collected into one um, huge volume called Annals of the Formal World, and it's a really wonderful read. Um, there are other things like the, the, geolo the Roadside Geology series has been published for at least 30 states and a few different uh, Canadian pro provinces as well. And there's several, several books out there about hiking, the geology that you're hiking through. There's geologic highway maps which you can use to navigate where you're going and also understand that the geology that you're seeing as you drive to your destination. And so there's really great ways to see the geology all around you at home and when you're traveling. And I've been really lucky to do this since I was a really little kid. And that's a picture of me and my dad at the top of Sunset Crater in Arizona. Um, so my dad was an earth science teacher, and he and my mom gave me the incredible gift, gave our family the incredible gift of traveling most summers. And so I feel like I did a lot of my growing up in the national parks. And uh, so I was kind of a junior geologist um, following in my dad's footsteps. And um, we don't have pictures of the kids. We have to stand in front of that outcrop for scale pictures. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and so when I went off to college, I took Geology 101 my first semester, and I never looked back. I went on, I got a master's degree at Texas A&M, and I've been working in the field for almost 35 years now. Um, so why didn't I look like a geologist? Why did I hear so often, especially early in my career, you don't look like a geologist? I'm wearing the uniform, right? Maybe my field vest is a little too bright. But I, I just worn one out, and so I got in a new one, and I'm not wearing that, that red plaid flannel shirt, but it was summer. And, and high-tech fabrics have kind of taken the place of flannel these days anyway. And I'm certainly wearing the uniform here on an environmental site um, in my Tyvek suit. But here's some anecdotal data. So actually, as an undergrad, there were about 50% of us were women in my graduating class. But I know there are many people, many women contemporaries of mine who had a completely different experience. Kathy Troost is a professor at University of Washington, and she went to a Midwestern university. She was one of two women geologists in a class of 30 graduates um, in, in around that same time period, which is the 19, early 1980s. When I was a graduate student at Texas A&M, less than 25% of my classmates were women. And when I took my first professional job in 1984, <laughs> I, I was working in a, in a geosciences office of a large engineering consulting firm. There were 20 geo professionals in the office, and two of us were women. A few years later, on a big project where I spent eight months in the field, I was the only woman of up to 20 staff members at the site. So I didn't look like a geologist simply because I was a woman. So now we're going to talk about some statistics. The AGI in this, in this slide is, is the American Geosciences Institute. It's actually um, an organization of, or, of geological organizations. And they do a lot of the metrics for the profession of the geosciences. So in recent years, according to their statistics, women graduates of geosciences program have remained steady at around 40%. And this is some workforce information from 2013. And the, the blue column are males, the green columns are females. 
This is the percentage of the geoscience workforce, and these are the various age groups, so older to younger in, in decade-long chunks. So you can see women in my age group make up about 10 to 20% of the geoscience workforce. But the good news is, is it's, it's been going up about 10% with each younger decade of graduates. The problem is, is that women are still hitting pretty serious barriers with respect to leadership and pay equity. And so there's still work to be done even though the numbers are looking better. And where we really have work to do is despite the inroads made by women in the field, we are an incredibly not diverse profession with respect to underrepresented minorities. And the same survey from the American Geosciences Institute showed that less than 12% of geoscience graduates were underrepresented minorities. And in another publication, actually by the National Science Foundation, it showed that the numbers were even worse, that even though underrepresented minorities earned 16 to 70% of all STEM degrees, only five to 7% of those were geoscience degrees. And I started thinking about this when I, I actually review scholarship applications for a field study scholarship that supports undergraduates going to field camp and graduate students doing field research. And what I noticed was that most years we have about 50-50 men and women applying for the scholarship. And most years we have very few underrepresented minorities and some years none at all. And it got me thinking about um, how many people I know in the field. I've been working in the field almost 35 years, and I know five African-American geologists and two African-American women geologists. And, and so I started doing some research and decided that we needed to be having these conversations as a profession about why, why we're not attracting people of diverse backgrounds. And one of the things that I think that the way I take this conversation is, well, what does attract people to the geosciences? And then maybe we can figure out what is, what is making other people feel excluded. So according to a paper in the Journal of Geoscience Education, there are four primary factors that attract students to geology. And they are a positive experience in an intro class. And so lots of professors and I have talked about how that Geo 101 class is really important. It, it attracts people to the field. Outstanding field experience, especially as undergraduates, it keeps people in the programs. Personal characteristics specifically, what you hear over and over again, is a love of the outdoors. Um, and then supportive family members or family members who have experience in the geosciences or know someone who does. Um, so I have all of those. <laughs> Um, and when I talk with geology programs, I usually ask the people in the, in the audience to raise their hand if they have one of those. And almost overwhelmingly, the whole, the whole class raises their hand. Um, so we've talked about what steers, geology, what steers students toward geology. So it's its culture. It's, it, when you're in it, it feels very inclusive. Students feel this camaraderie with others, with shared interest, a shared love of the outdoors. We generally look and dress a little bit alike. We fit into this club. And geology students actually spend a lot more time with these club members than a lot of other majors do, because in addition to being in class and lab together, we go on field trips together. So sometimes we're together on the weekend. We do longer field trips during the, the holiday breaks and we do that field camp together where, where we're camping together for six to eight weeks. There's a lot of bonding that happens with geology students. And when you're in that club, it feels very welcoming. But I think that we don't realize how, if you don't exactly fit that mold, how exclusionary it can feel. So this is, oops, I don't know where I am. Here we are. This is an old picture. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I drank a beer actually. Um, I'm not a big beer drinker. Uh, but anybody who knows a lot of geologists will tell you that that's like heresy in this club of, of mine. Um, actually, is a real beer culture to geology. But for me, I've been a member of the club a long time, so it doesn't bother me. But when you're young and you're trying to fit 
and you're trying to figure out what you want to do and who you want to do it with and what you want to study and who wants to work and study with you, not fitting into that culture exactly can be really difficult. So um, one of the things that is exclusionary, the Geological Society of America's career and diversity officer, her name is Tolly Bear, she's a young Native American woman, and she told me that, that this beer culture around geology can be very off-putting to Native Americans who have a lot of pain around alcoholism within their culture. Um, other things that are, can be very exclusionary from our club, the field camp, which I mentioned, which for me, and I'm a big fan of it, I support a scholarship that helps it, it tied everything that I've learned in a classroom or lab together for me. It made me decide that I, want, that I wanted to be a professional geologist. But if you're working your way through school, it's expensive, and it's six to eight weeks away from your paying job during the summer. So it's an economic exclusion factor. And I've been having conversations with a lot of professors during this lectureship about how do we get that capstone field experience for students without it being such an economic hardship for, for students. I mean, if you have a family, if you're a single parent, how are you going to make that work? We need to find other ways to get that experience for students without, make, without excluding them from the profession. Another thing I discovered during these lectures is when I, was, when I was speaking at the California State University campuses in the Central Valley, there are a lot of first generation students. Many of their parents literally work in the fields. And they come home during their Geology 101 class and they tell their parents, oh, I'm so excited, I want to do field work. Their parents are like, uh-uh, I'm not sending you to college to work in the fields. So one of the, we almost need a marketing plan for geology to talk about all the things that we do do in geology because even though many of us would, would like to spend 90% of our time with a rock hammer hanging off our belt, hiking up a mountain, none of us do that. Um, well, maybe a very, very small percentage do that. Um, so, so there are things, there are other exclusionary things that have come up, regional things, that the West tends to be a lot more sort of outdoorsy than, than the Eastern United States. There's sort of this, this, this value to being outside and being in the outdoors. Um, there's an urban and rural kind of, kind of tension. Um, physical limitations, a lot of geology programs without even realizing it, put a value on hiking and hauling a backpack prowess. And so we're automatically excluding people who may not be able to hike as far or carry as much. Color blindness is another thing that can get in the way. We use a lot of descriptive terms. And if you can't describe a rock with a certain color, we use these months old color um, charts to, dis to do give very detailed descriptions of color for soils when we're logging things. So there's all sorts of little things that, that can exclude people from geology. Um, I'm reading a book right now that was suggested to me by an African-American geography professor called Black Faces, White Spaces, that talks about why many people of color feel excluded from the great outdoors. And if that's one of the selection criteria for how people find their way to the profession, that's automatically excluding people from it. So as I was putting this talk together, um, I, I reflected again about this scholarship, these applications that I review. And last year, I was reading an essay, and I had an immediate reaction to something that a young woman applicant wrote. Um, and in retrospect, she was, she was very honest and very brave, because what she wrote in her essay was that she didn't really like field work. She wanted to be a computer modeler, but she knew she needed to go to field camp in order to be a good geologist and a good geological computer modeler. And I immediately had this, what do you mean you don't like field work kind of reaction. And as it turned out, she wasn't one of the top tier candidates for the scholarship. But if she had been, I might have let that little voice um, bump her down the list a little bit. And it was actually one of my colleagues on the committee that pointed out to me that I certainly wasn't serving the profession by doing that because we need good computer modelers. Um, and I wasn't even serving myself when I think about it because I'd rather be out in the field. And I'd like people who know how to do the computer modeling better and really want to do that behind the computer screen. 
So that made me think about, well, what are the other little biases that are coming up like all the time in the back of my head? And, and once you start bringing your attention to it, it's pretty astounding. So if someone lights up a cigarette, I have an immediate negative judgment. Um, drivers that cut in too close to me, and, and I live in kind of a rural area, I think you get more used to it in urban areas, but I have an immediate judgment about that. I can't believe I'm actually gonna say this, but when I see kids glued to their computer screen, I'm like, oh, I, pardon me, their phones. Oh, kids these days. You know, and whenever you have a judgment like that, it negates the individual. Um, none of those are individual judgments. I even, I can't believe that I had this one come up, but after my first week as the John's lecture, a friend and a colleague was driving me around and we'd done a lot, of, a lot of lectures in a lot of places, and we were kind of tired. And the next morning, we went to a restorative yoga class. And the woman was a very good instructor who had unnaturally white teeth. And all I could see the whole class were these teeth glaring at me. I'm like, oh my god, I have a bias against unnaturally white teeth. <laughs> so it's amazing how these things come up all the time. So those little pieces of paper that you have that Brett gave you and your pencils. So just take a couple of minutes and write down a couple of judgments or assumptions or biases for or against things that come up for you that might influence how you make a decision that isn't really fair to somebody or beneficial to your profession or your life even. that I know. Her name is Rhea Graham. She actually happens to live in a little town in New Mexico, Placidas, where I live as well. And um, when I started composing this talk, she, she came over to my house and we, and we were talking about it. And um, she is an incredibly accomplished geologist. She was actually uh, a presidential appointee. President Clinton appointed her as the last, she was the last director of the U.S. Bureau of Mines and ended up um, on, well, closing, closing that agency. They were folded into other agencies. And she mentioned several occasions, some of really serious um, prejudice that happened to her. And, and she was flying into Oklahoma City for a professional meeting and was actually detained by police um, simply for the color of her skin. And, um, and that was a fairly horrific, well, 
was a horrific thing to have happened to her. Um, and in fact, when she was finally released after being held for about an hour, she was walking through the airport to get her rental car. And um, several of the sky caps were also African American and they, they walked up to her and they said, this happens to every person of color that comes into this airport at that time. So, so you could be detained by the police in Oklahoma City simply for being black there. Um, so she talked about that. She also talked about when she would go to Geological Society of America meetings. Um, often, th are, these are huge meetings where thousands of geologists come from all over the country. And so generally speaking, the vans from the airport to the headquarters hotel are filled with geologists. And she said that she was never included with those conversations. People would be talking about work that they were doing and where they were studying, and, and she was never included. There was never, there was always the assumption that she was just another person going to the hotel. And then when people would see her at the conference with her badge on, she said that um, there was never an apology. Um, and she said she felt like their intimation was that she should have spoken up so that they didn't embarrass themselves. Um, she said it was a very odd feeling. And she said that even though most often she was the only African-American woman geologist in a room, and so she would have stood out for that reason, she, there was a sense of invisibility, like people would look over or, or through her because they didn't know how to engage with her in those settings. And um, so that was some of her experience. All right, so let's see what some of the things that came up for people. Oh, a bias against, I'm assuming against poor spelling. We're gonna assume that it's not a bias for poor spelling. Um, yeah, I have that one too, actually. Um, a bias against people who are too loud or aggressive. Um, mansplaining, yeah. If, if you don't think you've ever heard that, try being a woman geologist <laughs> at an outcrop. <laughs> Um, so someone who is dressed to the nines, a bias against that. Uh, it's funny, in some of the geology classes where I've done this, um, I, I got um, written comments that said, I have a bias against people who have really ratty field clothes, and then in that same pile of papers it'd say, I have a bias against people who have really, really new fancy field clothes. <laughs> so it really depends upon your perspective, right? Um, a bias against people who take unnecessary risks. And I'm sure there are people out there who, who are really engaged with risk takers, right? Um, a bias against bad punctuation. Oh, we have good writers out here, don't we? Okay. Um, a judgment about people who stereotype social gender norms. And a bias against people who don't, oh, driving, who don't merge until the last minute, yeah? Um, I, I'm, oh, bus etiquette, making room when needed, yeah, right? Cigarettes, so a smoking bias, bus etiquette. I can tell, see, I, now that would never come up in Albuquerque because we just have a horrible, a horrible transit system. So I have a bias against cities that don't have a good transit system. Um, uh, let's see. Being part of a Greek culture at college, right? Um, uh, a bias against majors that seem unpractical to me. So that would be, that could go lots of different ways, couldn't it? Um, an unkept look. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, I have this one too. People who say like between every word in a sentence. <laughs> um, and that person tunes them out. So, so that's one of, and, and by saying I tune them out. So maybe that person like doesn't speak real well like, right? But that person might have something to say if you can translate it. So, so that would be, be a bias and that might, you might be missing out on something because of your annoyance about that. Loud music on hiking trails, grr, I like that, I like the, the and I, I have that one too. Um, 
Women with visible plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Women in those, those, I'm adding a comment here, in those torture devices of very high heels. <laughs> um, a negative bias against pants falling down. And a positive bias for being well spoken. Um, a bias against yellers. Don't come home with me. <laughs> um, um, and smoking, or someone who smells like smoke. Um, yep. Being able to trust older men. A bias against women who aren't feminists. A bias against fad diet followers. Yep. So, so that gives you a sense of how varied this can be, right? From the little, the littlest things to really big things, and and how this stuff comes up for us, minute by minute, all day long. And and so the point of this exercise wasn't for us to beat up on ourselves about having judgments and making assumptions and having biases. It's human nature. Um, but what the exercise is about is about managing them and making sure that they're not managing us and, and bringing up to our consciousness what is often very unconscious, those decisions that we make. And I know I just got a, a big clump of scholarship applications now, and I'm gonna be paying more attention to those kind of flat, those minute by minute reactions I have when I'm reading the essays of these students. Um, so another thing I want to talk about a little bit is on the flip side of this, what should you do when you feel like you've been a victim of someone's bias or judgment or, or wrong assumptions? And I, I asked Rhea about that given the experience, some of the experiences she had, and her comment was acknowledge it, that you should definitely acknowledge it. but. Don't let it define you. Don't let it consume you. And definitely don't let it stop you from, what, from doing what, what you love. Um, and, and when I've spoken with several students during this lectureship, one of the things that, that we ended up talking about was, is it fair to ask underrepresented minorities who are breaking barriers in the field to break those barriers? Not only are we asking them to do good science, but we're asking them to break these, these cultural barriers within our profession. And no, it's not fair. But if they have the personality and the personal strength to do it, they're gonna open doors for the people coming behind them. And so, no, it's not fair, but if they can do it, they should do it. Um, and I'm just gonna relate one small experience that I had as a young professional that, um, it happened on, on that large field project that I was the only woman working on. I was actually in my late 20s, so I was pretty young. And before we mobilized to the field, there was a big technical meeting of, of all the clients' technical representatives, and there was one coordinator for them. And so that was basically our client, my, my consulting firm's client. And then there were several of us from the team of the consulting firm. I was going to be the field operations leader, and oftentimes the person, in, the people in the field are the youngest people, um, and so so I was the youngest person in the room and the only woman. And during a break in the session, this client coordinator walked up to me, and said, "Will you go see about the coffee?" <laughs> and I'm pretty sure if the field operations leader had been a man, a young even a young man, I'm going to guess that he wouldn't have been asked to go get the coffee. And a couple of weeks ago when I was giving this talk, someone asked me, well, what did you do in that situation? And the answer is that I was actually fairly stunned, <laughs> um, although I probably shouldn't have been. Um, and before I could decide what to say or to go get the coffee, actually, David Waite and his wife is here today. He was one of my colleagues on that job. Um, he's a health physicist, and he was the radiation safety offer, uh, officer for the job. Actually, even he had several roles. But um, he ended up being a really wonderful professional mentor to me. And so mentors don't necessarily have to be exactly in your field of study. 
Um, and he actually called the guy out. He said, she doesn't go get your coffee. Um, and so be that person. Be that person that steps in and calls people out when they ask something inappropriate and when they um, are, are interacting with people inappropriately. So um, thank David for that, Nancy, please. <laughs> I've never forgotten it. Uh, so there are a number of programs that have been developed to support underrepresented minorities in STEM careers. Most of them specifically support minority students pursuing academic careers. Um, and that will help with the overall problems of, of minorities in the STEM fields because the more professors that, that students coming up can relate to, that they feel like they look like and they can understand, they'll believe it's possible for them to fill those roles as well. Um, it's human nature to want to feel like we belong and that we're accepted and that we're valued. And that, and that belonging gives us freedom and courage to try new things, um, to become a professor, for instance, if that's, if that's what the goal is. So a few of these programs include the National GEM Consortium, which is the Graduate Education for Minorities, um, uh, GEM, Graduate Education for Minorities, and it connects graduate students with more than 100 universities for fellowships and industry and national labs for paid internships. The Michigan Alliance for uh, Graduate Education and the Professorate supports underrepresented minorities in the field. Fisk is a uh, historically black college and they have a partnership with Vanderbilt that they call the Master's to PhD Bridge Program that supports minorities going, again, into the Professorate. UC Merced has a program to support Hispanic students in the STEM fields. And the Geological Society of America has a program called the On to the Future program, which is supporting underrepresented minorities headed toward PhDs and becoming geology um, professors. But there needs to be attention paid to, these, to this issue in the private sector as well. And there needs to be initiatives to make consulting firms and industry more diverse as well. So what's also growing, in addition support, to support for increasing diversity, is the knowledge that there are inherent benefits in doing so. There's science that shows that diverse teams do better work. Um, so as part of a Scientific American series called How Diversity Empowers Science and Innovation, D.M. Lee, a female African-American biologist, pointed out that for much of his history, Science has been shaped by Western values with largely white European and American men deciding what was going to be studied and how. And that means despite the amazing discoveries and innovations that have been made, there are lots of questions that haven't even been asked or studied because our personal experiences influence what we're curious about and what we're concerned about. And so working from different perspectives broaden science, and that is if the scientific communities are willing to hear those voices and consider those perspectives. Diverse teams are going to be better equipped to understand and respond to the challenges that face all of us. We all need to be open to recognizing our biases and managing them so that we can be more open to diverse teams. And it's, it's not only the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. It's just good science. So that, that's, that's what we all want to do. Good science. Yeah. 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 I'm going to take just one more minute. And um, so there's references from the Always Book a Window Seat portion and the You Don't Look Like a Geologist portion. And if any of you are interested in these references, um, ask me for a card, I'm happy to email them to you. And if you'd like to explore the, these ideas further. And I just want to thank the two um, professional association foundations that support the Johns Lectureship and make it possible for me to be here tonight. And so thank you for that. And I hope that this has made you a little more curious about this complex and beautiful place that we call home and that you'll always book a window seat from now on.
take questions. We have about 25 minutes for it, so just go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question for Deb. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you first. <laughs> Have you any, any information about the um, geology surrounding the Hanford uh, tanks and what mitigation is um, required? I, I know of Hanford. I know people who have worked on Hanford. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The question was, is do I know anything about the environmental work and remediation that needs to be done at the Hanford site? And the answer is, no, I don't personally. Um, I know of people who've worked there, um, and, I, and I know that there's a lot of ongoing work, but, but I, I can't speak to it personally, I'm, I'm afraid. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I think that there's, okay, the, the question was, is this young woman is, is working in linguistics and is actually working, I'm gonna That's correct okay. me if I don't summarize this correctly, but she's working in diversifying um, that, that language would be part of the diversity in the sciences. And um, so she's asking of the programs that were listed, they're all for not just higher education, but higher, higher education. Yeah. They're mostly masters to PhD bridges. And she asked, is there a bridge to the lower levels to bring more people you know, into being first generation college students? And the, the answer to that is, I'm sure there are some programs and, and I'm not sure of, of where they are and what they're doing, but I, what I can tell you in the geosciences is that we need to do much better um, because one of the things, and one of our problems in the geosciences is it crosses socioeconomic lines but most college-bound high school students don't take earth science or geology of any sort. So the last time that they've seen earth science is in middle school, usually seventh or eighth grade. And so when people are starting to think about what they're gonna major in, earth science isn't on their radar screen at all. And so I'm kind of hoping this lectureship is gonna segue a little bit into me working more at that high school level and thinking about how to make the geosciences more diverse by getting more younger populations interested in studying it in the first place. Yeah, and one more question, thank you for that. Um, regarding like when you were stunned, when you were asked to get coffee, I also know what it's like to be in a position when you are the victim and you it's so hard to find your voice and to, and you, you mentioned somebody saying you should acknowledge the bio, bias well, I say, why not, you know, make a formal complaint? And what kind of advocacy do you have available for those people who don't have their voice at that moment because it's, it does stun you when you, you don't know how to fight that? So I feel like, as I was listening to you, there really needs to be a place or a group that says, hey, you're not alone. You're right. You are totally welcome in this community. Let us help you make that formal complaint and, like, knock that wall down. And I think that is definitely coming along. I know certainly in the Geological Society of America, and this is this is where sort of that beer culture can get us in trouble a little bit um, because people overindulge. And there have been many instances where people were acting inappropriately, uh, inappropriately. And certainly as an organization, the Geological Society of America is addressing that at its meetings. And, and I know of at least one situation where 
of male geologists was banned from GSA meetings I do too. forever. I, I, from Antarctica, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, actually, no, no, no. That's, no, there's someone else. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I'm sure there's a few. Yeah, him too. <laughs> him too. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually about a third of the way into this book called Black Faces, White Spaces, and there's definitely a deep cultural um, issue with respect to African Americans feeling welcome and comfortable, often in the, in the outdoors, and, and so given that that's a select, you know, kind of a self-selection criteria for being a geologist, if you don't feel comfortable in that realm, you're going to select self-select yourself out of out of that. And so there's kind of a, a two-pronged approach to dealing with that: is making sure that our outdoor spaces are more inclusive, and acknowledging the cultural history of of why those spaces might not feel comfortable. And um, and then showing more of what geologists do across the board. Like I said. We're not spending 90% of our time with a rock hammer hanging off our belt, hiking up a mountain. What are the other things we do? And, and how can those fields of the science be filled by people that, you know, we really need those diverse opinions? So that would be one way. Um, you know, I, a lot, I don't have all the answers. Someone invited me to give this talk at one point, and, they, and she said, because you're an expert in this, and I, I called her up and I said, I have to tell you I'm not an expert at this. I think I'm just old enough and bold enough to think that that someone has to be willing to have the conversation because that's how we're going to figure it out. Yes. Oh, yes. So the question was is what's the process to be a licensed professional geologist and how long does it take? Um, so it's actually a little bit different now than it was when, when I was a young professional because now there is something called ASBOG, which stands for the Association of State Boards of Geologists, and 33 states require it for you to be a practicing professional geologist. So when you're a geology student, um, when you're an upperclassman, you have to have taken a certain number of classes or soon after you graduate, you can take something called the Fundamentals of Geology exam. There is a cost associated with it, uh, but I think it will actually help you get your first job as a geologist because your potential employers will see that you, you're investing in yourself as a professional. Um, there are several good reasons to take it while you're still a student. Number one, students are used to taking tests and that's a skill that goes away after a few years. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And number two, you're closer to the classes that you're going to be tested on in the Fundamentals of Geology exam. And number three, like I said, it shows employers that you're willing to invest in yourself. Um, and then you have to practice. It depends upon the state. You have to look at the state regulation where you work. You have to practice for a certain number of years under a licensed geologist. And then you can take what's called the Practice of Geology exam. And that's when you get your license. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have an undergrad, an undergrad degree, and a master's in geology, and I'm about six months into a second master's in geotechnical engineering. Mm -hmm. And something that really struck me, I never even heard of engineering geology until after I finished my master's. Wow. It was never presented as an option. There were no classes in an undergrad. There were no classes in master's. It was basically that's what they do at like Colorado School of Mines and like one or two technical geology courses and it was never ever, no non-academic geology applications were discussed in the program. And I was wondering if that's something you see changing? It depends. <laughs> it
in some schools, yes, um, but I, I have heard the same thing. So, so I, I offer five lectures during this lectureship, and the one I've given most frequently is called How to Build a Geology, a Ge pardon me, a Geology Career You Love. And that talks about applied environmental and engineering geology, and it talks about the career tracks you can take in it. And it was the talk that I would have liked to have heard as a junior that I didn't. Um, and so, yeah, I went, to, my undergraduate institution was pretty much research oriented. I knew geologists became professors. I knew that they worked for oil companies, although I didn't know what they did for oil companies. I had a very vague notion about mining, uh, but I had no idea what I would do for 30 plus years. I was lucky. We, my, my dad, the earth science teacher, had a family friend who was a hydrogeology professor. And hydrogeology, by the way, is the study of groundwater geology. And so I had had a good research experience as a junior, and I decided I was going to go to graduate school. And so I called this professor to ask for advice. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to save the world from pollution. <laughs> and he said, well, you should study groundwater. And, and so that was great advice. And, and then it was before the internet. And so I went to the library, and I started looking through college catalogs. And I started writing letters to professors, and I found myself this really applied program. But it's still a real problem. And, and that's part of what this lectureship is about, is going out there to talk to students about what are the career choices. I mean, that's part of the problem. I actually met with a group called My STEM, Minorities in STEM, at a small college called Worcester College in Ohio. And what they were talking about was not so much that their parents all wanted, and they, many of them were first generation students, and it wasn't so much that their parents all wanted them to be doctors and lawyers um, or engineers, but what they wanted to know, what they were extending themselves so hard to do to get their kids into college, was they wanted their kids to have more choice and to have a, a productive career that they loved and so we need to do more about educating people about what that geology career is. Um, and by the way, a PGPE combination is, uh, is very strong. And so I'm sorry I didn't hear about it first, but, but it sounds like you're on a really great track. And PGPE, by the way, just in case, I should, that's jargon. Uh, <laughs> professional geologist, a licensed professional geologist, and a, and a licensed professional engineer. So PGPE. Yes? What do you recommend for younger 11 to 16 year olds for learning things like geology? Like when and what? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to need to learn that along the way. But, you know, um, I would say look into. Um, there's actually, there's a really great organization called the National Association of Geoscience Teachers, NAGT. Um, and they have many programs for, um, for, for people who want to go into teaching geosciences. And they may have something for the lower grades, I'm not sure. But they also might have resources that, that can help you find your way to more studies. Um, and I guess I would say anytime you have a chance to write a paper or do something you know, that you get to choose independently, choose that and have your teachers kind of, if, if it's not necessarily on their radar screen, get it onto their radar screen and have them help you pursue that. It's, it's a really wonderful career and I, and I, I seriously, I, I mean it when I say it's a career that you can make a living and make a difference and, and just love it as well. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Brett. <laughs> we do teach some geology concepts here, um, and I think we do have some camps usually that are geared towards. Specifically, we have um, girls' camps, so it's very you know inclusive for that. Um, I specifically did a John Day field camp to OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. So if you look out on the side, and then national parks. Those are my third love. Yeah, Absolutely. Parks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look at the, and in fact, the national parks, they may have some programs. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. You're going to say it. Okay, I guess I'll say it. So it works for you, too. What's up? Um, so I was part of the team program here at the Science Center called uh, Discovery Corps. And so once you hit high school, then you get um, you get job professional training in a work environment also. They kind of help people. They guide you through adulting, like taxes. 
is also that's um, through your college applications and things like that. Um, and Discovery Core also would connect you to a bunch of different internships. Um, so one of the ones that I did was a geochemistry internship at the University of Washington where I got to actually work in a lab and get my first like experience with geology and, you know, and finding out that it's not just field work that's into it, but there's also a mapping and um, million dollar devices that you get to play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So I actually had a question to take yes. you to the first part of your talk. What is your favorite plane ride? Oh. <laughs> Probably over the Grand Canyon. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, it's sort of my favorite backpacking trip that, that, that I, I've done. I've backpacked there, I think, about 10 times. And I keep telling myself, that I'm, I need to go other places, and I do need to go other places, but there's something about it that just keeps drawing me back. And I've actually done the river trip through it three times, which is, it's a bucket list item, definitely. It's, it's, there's something very magical about, about the Grand Canyon for me. So, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I've, um, I'm kind of hoping to do rim to rim for my 60th birthday, so I haven't done that yet. But I love going down uh, Bright Angel and um, along her, um, along Tonto and then up Hermit. Even though the Hermit's a really tough trail, it's just gorgeous. And yeah, um, I also also um, going down Kaibab and up. Oh shoot, I'm gonna remember forget the name of it. I'm spacing it, but going the other direction, going going east and and up. I can't remember. I can't remember the name of the trail. It's really it's short, but it's really steep. And I actually, I had a field job. I, I had scheduled a backpacking trip, and I had a field job in Massachusetts that I had to fly to from Flagstaff. So one of the times I did that route. I, we hiked out in moonlight at like five o'clock in the morning, and it was just magical. And I feel so sorry for the person who I sat next to on the plane <laughs> on the way to Massachusetts because I just come out of backpacking for four days and I'm sure I smelled horrendous. <laughs> I, and I probably really look like a geologist on the, at the end of that trip. <laughs> because Brett was helping me realize that, you know, when you're so used to jargon, it doesn't seem like jargon to you because it's just the language you speak. Um, and I said something about at one of the pictures. I said, this, this is my colleague on a headscarf. And she's like, headscarf? What's a headscarf? You know, so, so that's jargon that I'm just so used to that I didn't think about it. And what we discovered is that for, for some people, road cut is not, it's, it's jargon. Um, so, there, there's a couple. One on I-70 uh, west of Denver, uh, which shows the beautiful um, um, upturned strata. Um, and it's, it's very, it's, it's a, So I should say, do you guys all know what a road cut is? How oh. No, okay. No. Okay. Well, but we never did figure out the, the <laughs> definition for a road cut. Okay. So in, in hilly and mountainous areas, when they're building major highways, they actually sometimes drill and blast through hillsides. And, and what you end up with is a really nice vertical exposure of rocks that wouldn't normally be there. And, um, and the jargon term for that is road cut. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's a cut that is made for a road. Um, and geologists love it. And in fact, um, at the Geological Society of America meeting last November, 
I was at a presentation that talked about um, working with students who have physical limitations. And the tagline for that meeting was, road cuts are your friend, because you can get accessible vans up to them and stuff like that. So it's a really great way to see geology. And there's also a really great, um, there's, an, there's an industrial hygienist here tonight, Bob, and I worked on, a, on that really big project in Eastern Kentucky years ago. And um, there's a really great road cut that I used to drive um, to get to that site that, that shows some really, it, it's in West Virginia, and it shows some really beautiful sedimentary strata and a beautiful stream channel and some coal beds. And, and um, so it's like you feel like you're there when the layers are being laid down. Yeah? Uh, while we're on the topic of silly questions, if you could use any rock to describe yourself, which rock? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> on the topic of silly answers. <laughs> okay, so does everybody know what nice is? G-N-E-I-S-S -S is, it's a metamorphic rock. And, um, and I guess, I mean, not only with the pun intended, but, but nice has been through a lot. And um, I don't, you don't get to be a seasoned geologist uh, without going through a lot. Um, so, uh, or a seasoned person in life without going through a lot. So I guess, yeah, I guess I'd say nice, with some nice garnets in it. <laughs> Garnet nice. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna go ahead, okay. We're gonna just do one or two more questions. Okay, do geologists actually lick rocks in the field? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not at contaminated sites though. Okay. Yeah. because you can tell the difference between clay and silt. If you're, if silt is kind of gritty and clay is really smooth. Um, we also like roll it in our hands. Um, it tells you something between, with clay and silt content and sediments. Um, but yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. tell you anything. <laughs> yes. So in, during any of your work, have you ever found anything really old or cool in any of your any work that you've done over the years? Well, you remember you're talking to a geologist. <laughs> so but so I know rock you mean a not a not rock not a rock. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> a fair amount, and actually, if I were ever to go back for a PhD, I would probably study archaeological geology, and that kind of studies how geology has impacted um, civilization and how, and how civilization has impacted geology, and so um, it's a, that, that's a really interesting field. And so, you know, walking along um, trails in, in Greece, you find middens and, it, and, and actually, geomor geomorphology is the study of the shape of the Earth. And so it's the shape of landforms. And one of the things that's really interesting is um, maybe you've heard of tells. They, they call them tells in Israel. They call them in Turkey. They call them huyuks. So there's a very particular shape to hills that have been built by human habitation. And, and they're not a, a natural landform shape, and they have a very particular shape to them. So yeah, there's really interesting stuff out there that aren't rocks, too. <laughs> okay, unless we have one last question. We do, great, this will be our last. Is your house just filled with rocks? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And actually, what's really funny about it is that it's, when, it's, it's an adobe house, and when it melts back into the earth, and some geologist travels there later on, in there, it's going to confuse the hell out of them. <laughs> because there's rocks from everywhere strewn about the whole place. So, yeah.
all for grabbing a survey. For those who have grabbed them, uh, turn them or fill them out. There will be a place on your left as you leave to turn them in. Um, and there will be a place to put your pencils as well. So thank you once again for joining us, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.